Japan, a country that, from the outside, looks more technologically advanced than any other. Their crime rate, near 0%. Their culture, endearing and enriching. The country is also the third biggest economy in the world, with a thriving population that has a lifespan of 80 years old, 10 years above the global average. In many ways, this country is a utopia, an idyllic paradise amongst this world. However, if you look beneath the surface, you'll see that while all this is true, there's a much more sinister and darker side to life in Japan. Hiding in scrutiny are millions of Japanese people who have failed to successfully integrate themselves into society, ending up isolated without jobs, marriages, and any means to live a normal and happy life. These people are known as the Lost Generation, and they make up around 15% of the population in the country. Their heart-rending saga embodies Japan's descent from glory and ominously foreshadows its unsettling destiny. This is the dark side of Japan. During the 1980s, Japan was largely viewed as the next economic superpower and was speculated to replace the United States. It was also foreshadowed to act as an international economic hub, acting as a passageway between the West and the East. Much like how China is perceived today, there was once a period when Japan sparked considerable unease in the US. Discussions of an economic Pearl Harbor filled articles, along with concerns that Japan might purchase the entirety of the United States. Films such as Die Hard, Rising Sun, and Blade Runner depicted Japanese corporations seizing control of America and the global landscape. This apprehension originated from the Japanese miracle, a period of remarkable consecutive economic growth spanning three decades facilitated by a distinct economic system that was deemed superior to the Western model during that era. This anxiety stems from the three decades of enormous economic growth resultant from the unique Japanese economic system in the 1980s. Their system was characterized by close collaboration between the government and the corporate sector, specifically through the Keiretsu system. Keiretsu were large interconnected conglomerates that owned shares in one another and worked together to achieve shared goals. While these companies remained formally independent, their strategic alliances enabled them to pool resources, reduce competition and increase market power. This meant they essentially had access to infinite amounts of money to finance their aggressive economic expansions overseas. Simultaneously, the Japanese government played a critical role in nurturing and supporting these keiretsu. Through the state-owned National Bank of Japan, the government provided substantial loans to these conglomerates, allowing them to access virtually unlimited funds for expansion and investment. This financial backing enabled Japanese companies to aggressively penetrate foreign markets and acquire market share. The government also implemented protectionist policies to shield domestic industries from foreign competition. These measures included import restrictions, tariffs, and regulations that made it difficult for foreign companies to gain a foothold in the Japanese market. This allowed Japanese companies to dominate the domestic market and focus their resources on expanding internationally. While this system was imbalanced and unfair, this synthesis between government and conglomerates allowed the Japanese stock market to increase significantly. As Japanese products were conquering one market after another, this instilled a societal mantra that through hard work and obtaining a university degree, they could secure a stable position at a major corporation, which would provide them with the assurance of lifelong employment. Japan was unstoppable, and everything was going great. By 1991, Japan had been growing extremely fast for three consecutive decades, becoming the second biggest economy after the United States. As the economy grew, so did real estate prices and stock market values. However, by the end of the 1980s, this growth escalated into a speculative mania. Essentially, everyone believed that the economic boom and asset growth would continue indefinitely, and the more you invested, the more money you would make. Meanwhile, the Bank of Japan continued to print and lend money to virtually anyone who asked, regardless of the intended purpose or creditworthiness of the borrower. Then, one day, the bubble burst. Throughout 1990, the stock market fell by 43% and real estate prices followed suit. The bursting of the bubble meant that ordinary people had much less money to spend and no one was willing to invest in Japanese companies anymore, leading to the end of the economic boom. On top of that, in the years following the bubble's burst, cracks in the Japanese system quickly became apparent. It was revealed that corruption was widespread and common in Japanese business and government, from insider trading to stock manipulation, fraud, and bribery. Additionally, the practically unlimited supply of loans created hundreds of zombie companies, businesses that should have gone bankrupt years ago but kept surviving on a never-ending supply of cheap money borrowed from the state. In just 10 years, Japan's economy transformed from an unstoppable force dubbed the Japanese Miracle to a struggling entity known as the Sick Man of Asia. While economic fluctuations are commonplace, Japan's downturn had uniquely devastating consequences for an entire generation, leaving millions unable to recover. So what set Japan apart? 
To comprehend this, we must delve into Japan's distinct work culture and employment practices, which played a crucial role in shaping the lives of countless individuals during this turbulent period. Hidden under the eyes of the foreigners lies a very toxic and intense work and hiring culture that continued to persevere from the 1980s. Unlike any other job market in the world, a corporate career in Japan starts with Shushoku Katsudo, an intense job hunting process that university students undergo before graduation. Many companies, including the biggest Koretsu, hire only fresh graduates and only once a year, but in mass loads of people at once, fresh graduates in Japan undergo a rigorous job hunting ritual where thousands don identical black and white suits to participate in group interviews and seminars. If successful, they secure a job that they'll keep for decades until retirement, adhering to the common policy of Shushin Koyo, or lifetime employment. Companies also promote exclusively from within, grooming and cultivating employees to become future executives. These practices, which were essentially the universal standard in the 1990s and still common today, provide stability but create an incredibly rigid job market. Graduates have only one shot at a good job after university, and once hired, they remain with the company for their entire career. Those who fail to secure a position are left out in the cold, as most companies close their doors to them forever. However, when the economic bubble burst and the boom ended, this ritual was disrupted. During the boom, it was relatively easy to obtain a corporate job, but the changed economic landscape shattered this expectation, leaving many struggling to find stable employment. After 1990, most companies froze their hiring entirely for almost the entire decade, and they were not hiring any graduates at all to keep all their lifelong employees during the economic crisis. They eventually resumed their hiring in the new century, although finding a job became much harder ever since. But for a whole generation of people who graduated in the 1990s, it was too late. They were not graduated anymore by then, and so the companies would not hire them as they were hiring fresh graduates instead. Through no fault of their own, an entire generation born at the wrong time slipped through the system's cracks, missing their one shot at success. Millions were left behind, consigned to a lifetime of temporary part-time low-paying jobs. This era, dubbed the Employment Ice Age, gave rise to the lost generation those who graduated during this bleak period. With the Japanese economy never fully recovering, more young graduates from the 2000s and 2010s found themselves in similar predicaments. The somber 30-year span became known as the Lost Decades, a poignant reminder of the countless dreams left unfulfilled. The tragedy of the lost generation extends far beyond the individuals directly affected. Their unfortunate circumstances cast a dark shadow over Japan's future, impacting the entire society. With a whole generation of people in their 30s and 40s absent from the job market, they often rely on their parents for support, unable to achieve economic security or start families of their own. Nearly 15% of the population, almost 17 million people, make up this lost generation. This age group is typically the backbone of any economy, responsible for spending on housing, mortgages, cars, and supporting families, yet in Japan there's no one to drive this economic engine. The ripple effects of the lost generation worsen Japan's other pressing issue, the phenomenon of super-aging. Japan holds the distinction of having the world's highest percentage of elderly people, with nearly 30% of its population aged 65 or older. The country is aging at an unparalleled rate, partly due to the millions of children the lost generation never had. By 2050, the ratio of seniors to working age individuals is projected to be 1 to 1.3, indicating that there will be almost as many people over 65 as there are between the ages of 15 and 64. This rapid aging trend not only highlights the unique challenges Japan faces, but also underscores the need for innovative solutions to navigate this demographic shift. In most countries, the elderly rely on taxes paid by the working population for support. However, in Japan, this model is quickly becoming unsustainable due to the rapidly aging society and the lost generation's impact. Additionally, Japan faces a growing social issue known as hikikomori, where individuals, predominantly men, voluntarily isolate themselves from society, living entirely cut off from the world and depending on their parents for financial support. Initially, hikikomori were members of the lost generation, men in their 30s and 40s, who failed to meet societal expectations of securing a job, climbing the career ladder, and starting a family. Feeling overwhelmed and defeated, they retreated into isolation. Over time, younger generations joined their ranks, finding the job market too competitive and stressful, despite having opportunities to enter it. This phenomenon of hikikomori exacerbates the challenges faced by Japanese society, making it crucial to address these issues and find ways to reintegrate and support these individuals. 
Today, nearly one million men in Japanese society are identified as hikikomori, with countless others teetering on the edge of joining them. This social phenomenon is rapidly transforming into a mainstream issue, affecting society as a whole. The Japanese government recognizes the detrimental effects the lost generation and the increasing number of hikikomori have on society and the economy, announcing plans to support and reintegrate these individuals. However, success has been limited thus far. One of the main challenges is Japan's struggling economy compounded by an inflexible work culture. Employees face long hours, strict hierarchies, and companies that adhere to lifetime employment models, hiring only once a year and promoting exclusively from within. This rigidity leaves no room for breaks or second chances for those who fail to secure a position. Consequently, millions remain trapped and the numbers continue to grow as more young people struggle to succeed in this unforgiving system, ultimately giving up in despair.